Hello, welcome to the AEO Solutions channel. In today's video, I'll be presenting Sposas Method, which is um, particularly suited for a system undergoing torsional vibration, although it could be used for other forms of vibration as well, such as uh, being longitudinal vibration and many others. And we're going to use this simple system to derive some formulations that are applied in the OZAS method. And we're going to start by looking at this system, which is a four degree of freedom system, having four generalized coordinates, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, and theta 4. And just to define some of the terms, I is the moment of inertia, K is the torsional stiffness of the system, theta is the angular displacement of what will term generalized displacement. The first thing we want to do is to get the equations of motion for the system. And of course, because it's a four degree of freedom system, there's going to be four equations of motions. So that's the first one. We have the second one. We have the third equation of motion and we have the fourth one. Of course, if we have these equations of motion derived using any known techniques, it is the first step to begin to derive our formulations that, that is applied in the OZAS method. Next, we want to get an assumed displacement for each and all of the generalized coordinates. For the first one, theta 1, we can assume that the motion is harmonic, therefore equal to A1 sine omega t, where A is the amplitude, theta is the angular displacement, W is the natural frequency at T is time. And of course, if we differentiate the angular displacement with respect to time being presented as theta dot, we're likely to get this new equation. And if we choose to differentiate this equation further to get the generalized acceleration in the first degree of freedom, we're going to have theta one dot dot and is equal to this equation. And we can do same for each and all of the generalized coordinates having for theta 2 and for theta 3 as well and finally for theta 4. So these ones, so these equations we're going to combine with the equations of motion of the system to actually derive the formulations that are applied in the OZAS, tech, OZAS method. So let's recall our first equation of motion, which is I1 theta 1 dot dot plus K1 into theta 1 minus theta 2 is equal to 0. We've already obtained values for theta 1 and theta 2 as well as theta 1 dot dot. So having these values, if, if we insert them into the equation of motion, we are going to get a new equation like this. So if we decide to cancel out sine omega t, which is common in the equation, we're going to get a new equation, which is um, I1 into W squared A1 plus K1 into A1 minus A2 is equal to 0. And we can rearrange this to have a new equation. So we're going to walk through the same procedure for the second for the second generalized coordinates, the borders on theta 2. And we've obtained values for theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, as well as uh, theta 2 dot dot. So if we, if we insert all this into the second equation of motion, we are going to get a new equation. And having gotten this equation, we can decide to cancel out all our sin omega t from the equations. And if we do that, we'll get another equation, equation that is like this, which we can rearrange. And once we've done that, we get this new equation. So notice that we're trying to replace all the equations with their amplitude, that's maximum displacement and natural frequency, while eliminating our acceleration terms and our generalized displacement terms. So we can do same for the third degree of freedom by inserting some of all those values we've obtained into the equation to get a new equation on which we can cancel out sin omega t. And once this is done, we get another equation that represents our third equation of motion. 
we can as well proceed to do same for the last equation of motion which is the one in the fourth generalized coordinates we've gotten several terms which we're going to insert into the same equations once that is done we have a new equation and we can cancel out our sign omega t from the equation once we've done that we're likely going to get a new equation that is of this form so these are our new four equations and if we have these new four equations we can expand them as shown and we're going to be working with, with each of these equations to get certain formulations that are useful for estimating natural frequency and mode shape. So if we sum up all these equations first and foremost, all the equations we have on the left or the right hand side, we're going to have something like this. And once we have this, we discover that sometimes we cancel out themselves. And once that is done, we have a new equation. And this can be written in this form, summation of natural frequency squared multiplied by the, amp the amplitude and the moment, second moment of inertia. When you sum this up, it's equal to zero. And this is a very vital equation that is applied in the Ozer's technique. And we have our equations that we derived earlier. We can pick the first equation. We can rearrange it as shown. And from this equation, one can easily simplify to have that A2 is equal to A1 minus W squared over K1 multiplying A1 and I1. Let's recall our equation 1 and equation 2. Equation 1 can be written in this new form by taking a part of it to the other side of the equation. And we can rearrange it as shown. It is obvious that a part of this new equation is same as what we have in equation 2. So we can quickly use the other part to replace its counterpart in equation 2. And if we do that, we we'll get something like this as the new form of equation 2. So what we have done is to rearrange equation 1 and substitute it into equation 2. And from this, we can expand further. And if we expand that equation further, we can take the side containing A3 to the other side of the equation and rearrange. And from that, one can easily get a new equation for A3. So we call our tail equation and we try to rearrange it such that we bring out the minus sign in a part of the equation one. One can quickly take that part to the other side. So once that is done, we have a new equation. If we bring onwards our equation two that we evaluated earlier, we can rearrange equation two to have a new equation of this form. And once that is done, we can see that there is a similarity between this new form and the simplified equation 3. And we can use corresponding parts to replace what we have. And we're going to get a new equation. And if that equation is simplified, we can get a simple equation for A4. So we've gotten all our equations, taking our first displacement to be 1 as an example. We derived another equation for A2, and we derived another for A3, and the last for A4. It can be observed that all these equations can be written in this short form, such that AI, at every point in time, which will be A1, A2, A3, A4, or whatever the case may be, is equal to AI minus 1. That is, if you want to evaluate A2, it's going to be equal to A1 minus certain other expressions. If you want to evaluate A3, it's going to be A2 minus certain other expressions, and so on and so forth. And the other expressions is just a summation of the angular frequency squared divided by ki minus 1. That is, 
if you're evaluating A2, you're going to use K1. If you're evaluating A3, you're going to use K2. If you're evaluating A4, you're going to use K3, and so on and so forth. And this is going to multiply the summation of the product of moment of inertia and amplitude so that's maximum displacement and this you're going to sum up up to the height minus one term that is if you are looking for a4 you are going to sum up a1 times i1 plus a2 times i2 plus a3 times i3 that's up to the third term and so on and so forth so we've gotten two equations quickly and the first one is used for calculating ai that's the maximum displacement of any of the rotor after assuming the, the displacement of the first rotor to be one and another equation that is used to estimate the sum of what we call sum of torques used to estimate what we call sum of torques that is angular frequency multiplying a uh, moment of inertia and um, the amplitude for every of the rotors being summed up the conditions of use if the rotor is free at its end then the equation of sum of torques must hold that is the sum of torque must be equal to zero for correct values of natural frequency so the procedure involves guessing natural frequency, evaluating all the amplitude for other rotors after assuming one to be the amplitude of the first rotor, then finding the sum of torque. If it's equal to zero, then your guess is accurate. But this is done iteratively using any computer program. But if the rotor is fixed at any end, then the displacement at that end must be equal to zero for correct values of natural frequency. So we're going to quickly present how to apply the user's method. The first thing to do is to make a guess for the value of natural frequency. Then you take the displacement of one of the rotors to be one. So usually for convenience, you can just say A1, that's the, the maximum displacement in the first rotor is equal to one. Then you use the user's displacement equation to determine the displacement of all the rotors. So having making your first guess A1 to be equal to 1, you use the OZAS equation, displacement equation to find A2, A3, A4, A5, and so on for as many rotors that are present in the system. Then you calculate the sum of torques using the equation for sum of torque. Then after calculating the sum of torque, you repeat the process for other guesses. And then use a graph of frequency versus sum of torques to estimate the value of natural frequency for which the sum of torque will be zero. And however, for a system that is fixed at any end, the graph of frequency versus displacement at that fixed end should be used, since the correct value of the displacement at that fixed end will be zero. So it's better to use the displacement at that end that is fixed, equating it to zero to evaluate your natural frequency. This is an example of a shaft that has an end fist, and this is an example of a shaft that is free at its end. So for the different cases, the one with the end fist, you evaluate your natural frequency that you're guessing based on zero displacement at the fist end. While the one that is free, you, are, you estimate your correct value of natural frequency based on the sum of torques equation being equated to zero. I think this will be all for now. I want to thank you for your time and I do hope that this video was illustrative enough.